Hello, and thank you for tuning in to our Facebook Live Q&A, where we'll be discussing how to keep yourself and your children safe as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Elizabeth Van Camp, and I'm a member of the UI Healthcare social media team. And I'm joined by Associate Hospital Epidemiologist and Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Melanie Wellington, and Dr. Damian Creason, Head of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Division here at the University of Iowa. We will be answering your questions about the still present risks of COVID-19. So please submit your questions or concerns in the comments below, and we'll get to as many of them as we can throughout this broadcast. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Wellington and Dr. Creason. Good to be here. Thank you for having us. Of course. So one note for our viewers before we begin, this video is for informational purposes only. If you feel sick or your child feels sick and you're concerned about your health, please contact your primary care provider or set up a video visit to speak to a provider. So we're going on about five months of this pandemic. And um, I just wanna kind of know, how are you both feeling about the pandemic, about the, um, the fact that it just keep, see, seems to keep going on? Well, I think like everyone, uh, we would certainly prefer to it or if it were slowing down. And, um, you know, I think one of the, um, hopefully one of the things we're learning as we go is, is more about the disease, more about how the disease is transmitted and more and more about how we can um, actually improve our ways, our approaches to um, both keeping people safe and um, uh, at the same time, beginning to reduce um, transmission, um, you know, between people so we can actually, you know, get to the end of this thing. Yeah, I agree. I think we're all sort of tired and frustrated and we would love for it to have already been gone. But <clears throat> as Dr. Creason said, we're learning more every day. And in, um, in the scheme of things, as far as scientific research goes, we've only been dealing with this for a very short period of time for research purposes, which takes a lot longer than our day-to-day -day lives do. But we're getting there and, and we will get through it. Yeah, thank you for those encouraging words. It's always nice to hear that, you know, there is that light at the end of the tunnel. We will get through this. Um, can you guys explain to our audience how the virus is actually transmitted? And let's start with you, Dr. Wellington. Sure. Um, the virus is transmitted through things we call respiratory droplets. You can't usually see these, but anytime someone's talking or coughing or sneezing, tiny little droplets of fluid come out of your nose and mouth. And in, if somebody is infected with coronavirus, those droplets have coronavirus in them. And if those droplets then get in touch with somebody else's eyes, nose, or mouth, then that person can become infected. That can happen by the droplets coming out of one person and going straight into another person while they breathe them in or blink them in. Or it can happen by having those droplets fall down onto a surface and that person may touch that surface and then touch their nose, eyes, or mouth. Yeah. So one of the things that um, is important to keep in mind with this virus is that um, the droplets are much larger than what um, we re you will sometimes hear referred to as aerosols. And so aerosols are very, very small, small droplets. And um, the evidence we've had in the past for how coronaviruses have been transmitted is consistent with what we are seeing now. And that is the aerosols do not mediate the transmission. And so the droplets are, um, are the, the way the virus goes from one person to another. And that I think, you know, is also one of the reasons why um, having face protections is uh, an effective approach to reducing the likelihood that an per infected person will transmit that to an uninfected person. And the yeah. droplets are really the, you know, that, mechanism is is well established and provides a rationale for what we are you know advocating uh as the main approach right now for for breaking the cycle yeah and it's important to know that those droplets are big enough that they sink right. if this were transmitted by aerosols and we see no evidence of that aerosols are so small they float around in the air for hours but these droplets actually sink. So if one person's coughing and the droplets come out of that person, by the time the droplets get to three to six feet, they've actually already fallen down and hit the ground. That's why you always hear six feet for a social distance. Right. And so as a mechanism, as we, if you want to think about why face 
coverings and, and masks are effective is that it pushes in part, in part, there's a multiple ways these work, but it blocks the, um, the droplets and reduces the, the, the distance that they are able to travel. Um, I think of it like a snow fence. You know, you put up a snow fence and it's not a big barrier so that the snow hits the barrier and then net doesn't go any further. What the snow fence actually does is slow down the wind so that the, drop, that the snow in the wind falls to the ground before it gets to the road. And these are, this is a similar kind of uh, mechanism for how you know, the face coverings are, are working. Yeah, so face coverings really just serve as a as a barrier, right? It, it prevents the the virus from going anywhere out of our mouths or, or in you know into our eyes, nose, and mouth. So, can you explain to us um, whether face shields and face masks are safe for children, and whether or not they're necessary at all? You just covered that they do. We need the barriers, but do kids need them? And Dr. Wellington, do you want to start with this one? Sure. Face masks or face shields, we usually use the term face coverings, are safe for anybody who is aware enough and has the capacity to take them off if there's a problem. So most pediatricians will say somebody who's two years old or older, um, who's otherwise healthy, and anybody who's been around a two-year-old recently knows they're very good at ripping things off. <laughs> but anybody who can do that, if it's if something's happened and they can't breathe well and they can take it off, then it's safe for that person to wear a face covering. It is absolutely safe for kids to wear them. You hear a lot these days that maybe kids don't transmit the virus as much. That's some of that new information we're saying we're learning every day. But the problem is that don't transmit that much is not what you want during a pandemic. What you want is to decrease transmission as much as possible. And so Kids and adults should all wear face coverings anytime they're out in public. Uh, the whole the, the thing you'll hear Melanie and I coming back to again and again throughout this is we're um, interested in reducing risk, reducing risk of transmission, reducing risk that um, uh, you know some someone will have a, a bad outcome, and improving our ability to. Um, break cycles of transmission, stopping it from going one person to another. And, and there are multiple ways of doing that, but um, uh, you know, that's, that's the real key here is, is changing risk. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful um, insight. Um, but n now that we've covered that um, face coverings are pretty safe for kids, I'd love to hear, and I think some of the people watching will probably love to hear, your advice on how to make face coverings a normal part of our lives so that kids aren't afraid of them or they don't make them uncomfortable. So um, Dr. Wellington, I'm sorry, you're in the hot seat tonight. Today, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to start again. What are your tips for for making this a normal part of kids lives? I think you actually just said the most important part, which is we need to make them a normal part of our kids lives. We need to get kids used to wearing face masks. If that means practicing while they're running around outside at home, so be it. Um, we've actually talked to a bunch of kids about what makes them easier to wear. Um, and uh, the general kid, kid opinion on the street is they have to be soft and not scratchy. They have to be fitting well enough that they're not too tight and they're not flopping off of them. And I have a friend whose daycare requires them and her daughter is four. And it was a problem for about a day or two until Amazon delivered all the Elsa face masks. And now the entire daycare is covered with face masks with Disney characters on them. So not that everybody needs an Elsa mask, but whatever you can do to make your kid feel like this is fun, this is cool, this is comfortable, and let them be in charge of it and let them own it, then those are the things you need to do with your kids. But most importantly, talk to your kids. Right. I think, you know, if we go back over the years as pediatricians, we've um, uh, had a number of different things that we've added to ch children's lives over the years. Those include things like booster seats and um, bike helmets. And, you know, we, I'm, you know, Melanie and I can, and every other pediatrician have heard, oh, you'll never get a kid to do that. Oh, this is too much. My kid will never wear that thing. They'll hate it. And we do things like, you know, put, um, you know, dinosaur uh, tails on the, on the bike hel helmets. You put, 
you you know make a game out of getting them in and out are you a big big boy a big girl who can get into your seat um, those sorts of uh, strategies which have been applied to you know other things that kids at the beginning may say yeah i don't really want to do that we can we can work with this we um you know we have ways uh you know to to make it fun but also make it again as melanie said part of um how uh you know daily life for the time being yeah and make sure they know it's not an option right i mean it's just it's wearing a mask is not their choice let them pick are they going to put on the left side or the right side first if they're little let them pick what it looks like if they're older let them pick where it's stored if they're much older right but the wearing of the mask is not an option yep. that's really important. those are great tips i know um you guys hit on several things that got my three-year-old comfortable with her <laughs> her face covering she has a shield um, that has kitty cat details decals on it, loves the thing because it's a cat um, and she's allergic to cats and will never have a cat, but she can have her cat face shield. Um, and then, you know, even her mask the other day, I was taking her to a doctor's appointment and I grabbed one that has ear loops and she really doesn't like that. She likes the straps that she can tie right. and she immediately goes, no, 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 no. And I like just carefully pulled down the str string on and she goes, that's my mask. Yeah. So, you know, just like, like you said, making her comfortable. And then we've just made it a part of daily life. She sees my husband and I put on ours when we're going out. Um, so leading by example, I think, but like you said, like comfort is a really big thing with a lot of kids. So I'm really glad you guys could provide some of those great tips for our audience. Um, so we are having a lot of people ask on Facebook right now, what, what are safe ways to get kids interaction with others? This is such a hard time for, for families um, where they're not going to school and they're maybe not getting to even play with their neighborhood friends like usual. So um, Dr. Creason, I'm going to direct this one at you. And then Mel, um, Dr. Wellington, feel free to chime in if you'd like. But um, can you give our audience some tips on how to keep their kids safe as they go to the store or if they do want to go throw a football with a friend in the neighborhood or even visit a playground? And so we're going to first of all start off with the notion of the, the most important notion here is we're we're trying to reduce risk of transmission and risk of infection and so um i think we kind of have to get rid of the idea of safe and not safe that that's really not useful it's like how can we make it as safe as possible and so you know initially is you know our if with family going to you know we have i think we have both had interactions with a number of, of our colleagues and, and other folks who have been, okay, um, can I take my, my, um, my kids to see the grandparents? I think that's probably one of the most uh, worried about uh, um, uh, visit that, that is happening right now. And how do we make sure that um, our child isn't going to be the vector or actually keep in mind, the more likely vector here in that interaction is the adults. So first of all, your children, our data, um, what we have learned over the first six, eight months of this um, uh, pandemic, going all the way back to the beginning of it, you know, in, in China is that um, children do not show the symptoms, but they also are a very inefficient vector. In other words, they don't mediate the transmission very effectively. That doesn't mean we, as, as we've already said, just, you know, let them do their go about life the way they, you know, they used to, we need to take precautions to further reduce that risk. Um, but uh, having your children interact with um, grandparents and other um, uh, uh, family members who are at high risk, um, overall is relatively safe. Um, particularly if we take the precautions that we've already been talking about, face coverings, maintaining, uh, you know, uh, social distancing, three to six feet, um, probably not, um, uh, probably limiting the total duration of the, of the visit. Um, you know, if, when my kids were visiting their grandparents in the younger age, they were, uh, it was great for about 35 minutes and then they wanted to go outside and play. Yeah. Awesome. That's that's great. You know, that's the kind of thing we need. We need to um, uh, keep in mind of and, and uh, not force them to be all together. Visit outside when it's possible. Right now, it's it's certainly possible. Um, in fact, when it's 90 degrees, it kind of goes the other way. But 
um, you know, the uh, transmission is much le less when you're outside than when you're inside. And so those sorts of things can, can really um, improve, again, improve our risk reduction and make it as safe as we can. Yeah, I, I just would add, we talk a lot about layers of, of protection so that, um, I think you alluded to this, but just to really bring that point home that social distancing is a layer, face coverings are a layer, good hand hygiene is a layer, limiting time together is a layer, and knowing who you're going to see or not see. So right. if any one of those at any point something happens, like for example, I'm wearing a face shield and I go like this, because obviously I talk with my hands and my face shield goes flying, if we're still distanced and if we have all those other measures in place, they make up for those temporary crazy moments of life. Right. And, you know, it's it's um, it's a little bit like, oh, uh, I don't know, if you have a plane crash, it's usually not because one certain thing happened. Right. Is that and because we don't have planes that are dependent on one thing. We have planes that have redundant systems, things that will protect the plane from staying in the air. And when we use those or something keep like that, I mean, <laughs> keep the plane in the air. There we go. <laughs> um, uh, and we need to use the same ideas when we when we have social interactions, we get people together, we get kids together. You know, getting children together is is, again, a child with a child. We're taking two low risk um, uh, people and we're, we're having them interact. If they keep the same layers of protection in place, that is absolutely um, a good thing. And absolutely, we want our children to continue to interact. And you know, we don't, we want this to be social distancing, not social isolation. The social isolation is something that none of us, no matter how old we are, do well with. That's very helpful um, because I, I think that gives, it probably gives a lot of parents a lot of hope for the rest of the summer of that the, the kids can have some interaction, especially if we can get outside to do that. Um, so one person did have a clarifying question for you, Dr. Creason. Um, does vector mean carrier? Could you explain yeah, what you were saying sorry. earlier? Got a little jargony there. It's <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things about this virus that distinguishes it from other um, respiratory viruses is that children in general are poor transmitters in other viruses like influenza. I can't take it anymore. In English, children are just not as contagious as adults are. There we go. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I went from one jargon to another. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, and so, yes, I mean, you know, the joke, yeah. Um, but it, it is, it is, um, I think at this point, very well established that the ability of children to transmit the disease, whether they are asymptomatic or symptomatic, is much, much less than, um, uh, than adults. And it's very similar to a, a, a disease, another disease that is respiratory, and that's called tuberculosis. In tuberculosis, where you have an adult who's infected and has pneumonia to the point where they are infectious, we have to isolate them. They are highly infectious. We put them in, in, in very specific um, uh, isolation. Children who have the same extent of disease cannot transmit. They don't transmit anywhere near as well. So it's very similar to the, um, uh, that situation. And, and so um, it, it is a little counterintuitive to what our usual experience is with respiratory viruses, but um, I think that's one of the, the solid pieces of information we have um, learned over the over the last six to eight months. Thank you. Thanks for breaking that down, both of you. I think that's helpful. It's so hard when we have experts that are, you know, that's your um, the language you might use on a day to day basis, and we're like, hold on, what does that mean? <laughs> so I appreciate you breaking it down further for us. Um, I just want you guys kind of touched on it already, but. Um, I know Dr. Uh, Jorge Salinas provided me this week with some easy things to remember with kids. And maybe you guys agree with this too, the three C's and the three W's when you're trying to talk to your kids about the pandemic right now, um, you should avoid the three C's, closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with people nearby and close contact settings with close range conversations. So those are the things you should avoid. And then the things you should do are the three W's, 
wear your face mask or shield, watch your distance and wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. Are those pretty good recommendations for to break it down for kids? Mm -hmm. And I think also if you have any kids who are interested in any sort of military kind of thing, the other thing I've heard people say is protect your men. That's a good mouth, eyes, nose, protect your men. That's a good idea too. Um, so, so school districts are starting to think about what this school year is going to look like. It's a, I know everyone's talking about it and is wondering what, what are we doing this year? Um, can you help us understand how to keep kids safe as schools reopen, especially if kids are going to class in person and Dr. Will and Tim, we'll start with you. Yeah. And, you know, again, I'll emphasize that nobody is ever safe. Um, it's not something we like to think about very often, but for example, when you're driving to Hy-Vee to get your groceries, there could be a car accident. So we don't want, we can't get to safe because nobody ever does. What we're really trying to do is get to as safe as possible. And just to be clear on this, as safe as possible, the things that we can do and that we definitely can make happen, that is absolutely safe enough. Okay, so if you if you sort of put things together, and if safe enough is the same as safe, then we we're fine because we can be safe enough. The things that um, that the schools will do, and the things that we can do with our kids as we send them to school, are pretty much the same things that you would do if you were walking down the street. Uh, we talked already about getting your kids comfortable with masks. Now, um, the majority of schools will have some sort of rule about face coverings. They might what's called a mandate, which is a rule that you must be wearing a face covering at all times. Um, but with kids, I always worry a little bit about those because kids are a little bit, honestly, more honest about human nature. And I think that um, the way to approach it is to have positive reinforcement. So if you want all the kids in the school to wear their face masks, throw a pizza party for the classroom that has the highest rate of face mask wearing every time a monitor comes into the room. That's far more effective than just saying, these are the rules. So some sort of face covering is certainly going to be involved. And your the kids' teachers should definitely be wearing face coverings. Because one thing we don't talk a lot about when we say are our kids safe at school, kids are much less likely to get infected. They're much less likely to give it to somebody else. And if they do get infected, they're very, very unlikely to have severe disease from it. So I don't worry quite as much about the safety of the kids as I do about the adults. So the teachers and the bus drivers and the other educators and the other staff in the building. Um, so they, the adults in the building are definitely going to be wearing a face covering of one type or another or several. So the other thing to do is not only get your kids used to wearing face coverings, get them used to seeing people wearing face coverings, which shouldn't be that hard because you they should be seeing you. Um, so face coverings is one. Distancing. People often ask me, well, how could they possibly get to six feet spread out in this room that has all these kids? But again, remember, the goal is to have all these layers. And if one layer is not perfect, but it's very, very good, again, that's safe enough. So if we spread the kids out in the room as much as we can, and then we make sure that we have a good solid six feet between the kids and the teacher, we're on that in a minute, um, then we're really prioritizing protecting both the adult and the kids um, from bad disease. Now for the teachers, there's actually something going on right now that's convenient. I know, how, have you ever heard that in the last couple of months? We actually got lucky with something. And that's that the littler kids are the least likely to be contagious. So the teenagers are going to be more contagious if they have the infection than a five-year-old would, but that's okay. Because when was the last time you heard a teenager say they wanted to be six feet or closer to their teacher? So the fifth grade, the kindergarteners and the second graders and stuff who are always mobbing their teacher, they're the ones who are actually the safest of all the students. So we got lucky on that one. And um, the distancing is gonna happen as best as it can. Yeah, I think um, one of the things to, to emphasize there, Molly, sorry to, um, no, no, no. Um, is that uh, as the pandemic has progressed, we've learned that um, three feet actually um, has um, nearly the same benefit as six. We do get a, a, an improvement in our risk reduction at six feet, but relative to three feet, particularly in a low risk, low transmission environment that the school is, those distances are, are very safe, 
Yeah. Or, uh, and so, um, you know, we can actually, uh, you know, uh, we arrange our school system, our school rooms, um, not quite to this, you know, the six feet um, uh, rule that we've been going by. Um, the other thing is that we, in the pan, in what we've learned to this point, working in hospitals, working in um, daycares, adults working in much more high um, density and high risk environments like the hospitals, like improvements we've made in areas like um, processing plants and that, the power of PPE is, you know, undeniable. And so, you know, areas where we used to be seeing, you know, outbreaks, we've been able to break those cycles. And so, um, uh, you know, teachers, uh, you know, my, my daughter is going to be one soon, hopefully. Um, and um, you definitely have concerns about being in those environments. But um, what we have learned to this point and the um, things we can do to protect adults are, are very, um, very effective. And so we can be um, reassured by our experience to point to this point in much higher risk environments that this will be safe for not only the children, but also for the adults that are working in the, in the school. Yeah, we should point that out. Damien's not kidding. I think it's what, two or three weeks now before his daughter starts her career as a teacher. Yeah. So when, when he tells you I'm good with this, it means something. Yeah, absolutely. I've got two clarifying questions based off of what you guys um, were just talking about so, from um, people on Facebook. So the first one is uh, Molly. I'm not sure if she's a teacher, but it sounds like maybe she might be. If we're working with students outdoors, do you recommend keeping that six feet apart um, and wearing a mask or how, so basically how safe are classrooms if they, if they take the classroom outside? You've reduced your risk dramatically doing that. And um, I wouldn't, um, I don't think it's a good idea to necessarily um, relax the rest of the layers that we've been talking about. Um, it is a way to improve um, uh, our risk reduction. Um, and it also means that, you know, if, um, if you need to get three feet apart to, I don't know, look at a, a bug that you found or something <laughs> when you're, if you're in your science class, um, you know, that you, you should feel very, very good about that because it's essentially, and nothing's 100% in medicine, it's certainly not 100% in this pandemic, but being outside um, reduces your risk of, in, of transmitting or being transmitted to dramatically. There's nothing like aeration and wind flow. And that's why we want open windows and buses and open windows when, whenever possible. Yeah, and I wanted to just add on to that, that like image of everybody looking at the bug, right? Um, that we've mentioned this, but I don't think we dwelled on it, but that's timing. So when you're walking past another person in the hallway, when everybody gathers for 30 seconds to look at a bug, right? Those very brief interactions have very low risk of transmission. You really need to sort of be in somebody else's cloud for a little while in order for transmission to happen. And so, um, you know, if somebody needs to pass out papers or pencils or kids gum up in line at the pencil sharpener or something like that, right? right. If those are those very brief interactions are, are really not very risky at all. Right. That's and great. That's great like, to know. Yeah. Like high V, right? When you accidentally do this at high V. Stress yeah. about everything else. <laughs> that is great to know. Um, I think I know that gives me a little more peace of mind about when I'm having interactions with people. So it's, it's also related to like, um, you know, part of the, the a, AP's recommendations and, and suggestions that they put out a few weeks ago, you know, having lunches in schools at the desk rather than having them um, uh, at, in a lunchroom. At the desk, you know, at the desk, you still are maintaining, it's, a, it's easier to maintain that three to six feet. Whereas in a lunchroom setting, it's gonna be take a whole lot more of intervention to keep that um, uh, distance. And you're also increasing the total number of people inside a given space. And you're becoming you're, you're starting to violate the C's that you were working about. Mm -hmm. about. So we want to make sure you know there are ways we can we can alter our school days to make them as safe as possible. 
Yeah, somebody just asked something about that. It was perfect timing. Kelly says, what about students sharing supplies? Do we have tips on should that just be a no go this year? Everyone needs their own or, you know, do you guys have any recommendations on that? So there is a little bit of risk. Remember I said those droplets yeah. fall and then also human beings inherently we touch our face. It's part of being human. So somebody who was infected and coughed on their supplies or touched their face and then touched their supplies because their face also has virus on it could theoretically put the virus onto that supply. And then the next person to use it could touch that, get virus on their fingers, and then again, touch their face. And certainly that does happen. But the more we do this, the more we're realizing it's not as frequent as we thought it would be. Um, so again, it, it, it comes down to sort of basically some common sense and some practicality and those layers we're talking about. And, so, and having, you know, having hand sanitizers and having, um, you know, being able to, to um, you know, make sure that, that you can clean your hands when you need to, it would be a good idea, you know, for, pick those up, clean them off. All right, we don't need to be sanitizing every single non-inanimate um, uh, object. Um, but there are, are things we can do that are fairly simple to make sure that um, those sorts of relatively infrequent, but, you know, um, events are, are, are dealt with as, as um, appropriately as possible. Yeah. So if it's a supply you're going to be like using in a personal space all day, like your pencil, everybody should have their own pencil. Yeah. I mean, again, common sense. If there's one stapler in the classroom and everybody's got to staple something in order for it to happen, that's a great excuse for a hand hygiene break. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and like having those conversations. So maybe taking that as an opportunity too, as they're using the hand sanitizer to be, to remind them and make sure you don't touch your face kiddos. You know, is there, it, you know, that's the kind of like things we should be doing just to reiterate that throughout the day, right? Mm -hmm. Although I also don't want anybody to have any guilt if their kids touch their face okay. because yeah. you can, it doesn't matter who you are. Obviously, yeah, you know, I have meetings with all of the infection experts in the hospital on a regular basis. And we'll be sitting there and you look over and someone's like, hmm. Um, talk about pressure. I've been having to do these with all of you experts and randomly I'm like listening and I'm like, mm-hmm. Oh, like, mm -hmm. I'm sure I've done it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if, your kid, if you look over and your kid is touching their face, yeah. it's time for a big deep breath and yeah. just sort of yeah. decrease it as much as you can again, but but the things that you can't change, you could probably take that energy and use it someplace else. Yeah, I know. We've kind of just chosen the battle with my daughter of if we're going out, that's when we really remind her. Remember, when we're doing X, Y, Z, don't touch your face. And if you do, that's OK. Just come get some hand sanitizer. And we just have hand sanitizer in my purse or easy to access so she can say, I touched my face. And she doesn't freak out, but she does go like, I need. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. just kind of choosing that battle of I like you said, I I would go nuts if I tried to stop a three year old from touching their face all the time. But if I can at least just at, in those high, higher risk moments, mm -hmm. remind her not to do it. So that's my yeah. strategy. at yeah. least. And then if you have a kid for whatever reason where this is a massive issue and you just can't stop. And, you know, I mean, what do they say? Five percent of three year olds pick their nose and the other ninety five percent lie. Right. <laughs> but if this is really a big problem, then something to think about is to maybe consider a face shield as your face covering instead of a face mask. Um, anyone who's ever worn a face shield for more than about three minutes has done this, oops, <laughs> because um, the face shield, in addition to protecting you from those droplets going back and forth, it makes it really hard to touch your face. And it serves just as an extra little reminder. Putting a stethoscope on with one is still a challenge for me. <laughs> so even you guys are learning to adapt to this new normal that we have. <laughs> well, this new situation we have. I don't like normal, new normal because I think we are going to go back eventually to um, something else. And I'm, I, as Melanie knows, I have lots of little um, word things that I get hung up on, and that's one of them. Um, I, I think we we are in a situation that we have to take very seriously and we are changing things and thinking about things we do every day in a different way. Um, and uh, sooner or later, that will be a different way that we don't have to worry about again. 
Yeah. Thanks. That's a great reminder to just reframe how we're, we're thinking about some of these things because it's very easy to, to feel kind of down about stuff right now. So reframing oh, yeah. it into a more positive way is a great reminder. And I think we all have those moments when we just sit down and we're like, I can't do this anymore. This is never going to end. And then for our job, one of the nice things that happens is then a new paper will come out showing us that, um, hey, if we do something this way, we're going to have much more success at a prevention measure. Or when the data started to come out about kids not being as contagious, that really gave me a second wind because it makes a lot of life much simpler. Yeah, and you're touching on a great, um, a great thing that uh, we wanted to ask you guys about because a lot of people are frustrated or confused by the changing precautions or recommendations and understandably so we've been doing this for almost half a year and i think about what i did at the start of the pandemic versus what i do every day now and it's different um so uh dr creason can you kind of explain why things seem to change so often during this pandemic well first thing we have to realize is that um in normal when we're dealing with other new uh, diseases or infections or other changes in medicine, those happen over usually years. And we learn about things, um, you know, really on a year scale, not or, even decades. On a, or a decade, and not on a week, um, not on a month, and certainly not on a day to day basis. And so what um, we have been dealing with in the in the last few months is an enormously compressed sort of knowledge cycle, if you will. And um, things you learn early, uh, you know, we start off with certain uh, assumptions based on what has happened before it was things that we think are similar. And so, you know, some of uh, initially the WHO and the CDC were not recommending people to wear masks, right? And you're like, okay, well, why the heck are we, you know, now going completely 180 degrees in the other direction. And prior to it, to the coronavirus um, outbreak uh, pandemic, there was no good data that suggested that wearing masks would help anyone in, in the viruses that we had seen and dealt with the seasonal viruses up until that point. And um, over time and uh, in fairly rapidly, I would say, again, we are in incredibly in, uh, compressed situation, um, it has changed. You know, we now have data um, and experience that um, it, in, with this particular virus um, uh, especially, it is our best, one of our best approaches. And so those sorts of things, you know, we, we started off with all kinds of different ideas about how to treat it, and we're still evaluating those. Keep in mind that a normal, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Melanie and I both work on are, are new new medications for infections. And a normal clinical trial takes years to, to set up, design, and execute. And we're having to do that in an incredibly, com again, compressed. And so, um, you know, nobody is, is um, you know, changing their mind just because. And we're not just you know, this isn't uh, flip-flopping. This is, okay, this is what we assumed. This is the best evidence we have right now. We're gonna have to make decisions. And so we're making the best decisions we can. And then we get new data and we say, okay, we're learning from that. If we didn't learn from that, then we're, we're not doing our jobs. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And it, from, you know, from a, when you compare it to going to the doctor where you know, you come to see one of us and we say, well, we're going to treat you with um, this antibiotic. We don't call you up, generally don't call you up next day and say, okay, we're going to change that. If we do, we warn you because things might change. And so this is a very different situation. Yeah. And, and just to, to kind of twist it around a bit, we're all frustrated. Human beings do not do well with change. And I am maybe person number one that fits that rule. And so changes are frustrating. But if you think about it this way, that every time we make a significant change in the advice or guidance or recommendations or rules for the world, it means that we found out 
another piece of important information. So every time we make a change, you can actually think, wow, a change. They must have much more new information. And we are just that much closer to getting rid of this thing. So every time you hear us going, OK, here's our new recommendation, it's because we're just one step closer to done. Well, that is a statement that I think everybody wants to hear. We are one step closer to done with this thing. <laughs> Um, uh, we have just a few minutes left, so I want to touch on a few of the questions that are that are rolling in. And we've had lots of people ask during this live about kids who have compromised immune systems or underlying conditions. So I would love if you could address with them um, what kind of precautions do they need to continue to take with kiddos that have underlying conditions and things like asthma. I know we already talked about that there's lots of different ways to um, have a barrier and there's lots of layers of precautions we can take, but just touching on, you know, kids who can't wear a mask. So first, just talking about kids that have those underlying conditions. And then if we could also touch on the, what to do if, if masks just aren't an option. Yeah. Um, Melanie, you, you were, uh, oh. so I'll start. Um, okay. uh, it, because the, that there are so many different underlying conditions, particularly in children. So um, we have um, pretty good data from adults because they have had a lot more infections and it has affected a much wider selection of, of people. And we have very, very well-defined uh, risk factors um, for or um, worsening disease, probably fewer for who would actually is increased risk of catching the, the virus. But in children, we have much fewer um, infections and fewer children who have overall underlying conditions. And so I really think for, for most children um, who have, are fit into that category, um, it's best to have a con uh, conversation with your primary care physician and the specialist who is involved in their care, because really it comes down to a one, really a case by case sort of situation. There's some, you know, children with asthma, um, which is much more prevalent um, from the adult literature, it turns out that our experience is, again, somewhat paradoxically, they're not at much higher risk of either bad outcomes or getting the disease. Having, I have asthma myself, and it is one of the things that I had to like deal with when putting a mask on, right? Is I don't, I am very sensitive to how hard it is for me to go and take a breath. All right. And so for smaller children, that might be a great way. I wear myself when I'm in the lab and walking around in the hospital, I wear a face shield. Um, it's just more comfortable for me. And I feel like I'm, it's, they're equivalently um, uh, efficacious. And so those are the kinds of things you can, you can think about. But for significant health issues that in which a child has is under the care of a subspecialist, it's best to have a discussion with that subspecialist to come up with um, a plan. And there may be certain things where that are part of their daily life that they may want to avoid right now or take additional precautions. Maybe, you know, um, uh, going to something where there's less people there or, you know, there are a number of different things you could, you could, details you could work out. Yeah. And if you have a kid who just can't wear anything on their face for one reason or another, um, the under two year old crowd is a, you know, really, if somebody's younger than two, you really need to think about it before you put something on their face. Um, again, keep the distance greater, keep the time shorter, keep, make sure people are using good hand hygiene before they interact. Um, hopefully the whole face mask or face covering thing will become such a big deal and so popular that, um, you may start to get dirty looks when people see your kid not wearing something on their face. So I don't know, I'm thinking about like buttons or something. Sorry, you know, we can't wear a mask. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah, I'll get I'll get on those right away. Thank I'll you. Get <laughs> <laughs> so you guys touched on that, but um, we had like a specific question about someone whose child has a heart, a heart condition. So he's a doctor for it. Um, and she said, I've been really, really extra careful with them. Should I can continue to be extra, extra careful? Or as school gets started, am I just going to have to let go a little bit and, and just continue to do the things that keep him safe enough? I think the the best thing for, so one of the things we don't want to do is give 
specific recommendations for a specific patient in this setting. I'm not trying to be evasive, but it's it's really, um, uh, I think, a best one-on-one -on -one, case by case situation. Um, uh, and and the things that you can take away, hopefully, from our discussion here is that um, there are the risks of transmission to a child are very low, and that's a good thing. So there, being in being with other children is not a high risk environment. Being at a bar with a whole bunch of of adults who are not wearing their mask is an extremely high risk environment. And so, um, you know, general principles, you know, with uh, a child with an underlying condition, um, it's prudent to be more careful. And part of that is having a discussion with your, your physicians and really thinking about the, the uh, important activities in the child's life and making those as safe as possible. And just very quickly, I know we're short on time. You're, um, we talk to other pediatricians and other doctors around the state all the time. So talk to your doctor about your kid. And if there's something that's in the gray zone or somebody needs reassurance, your doctor probably calls us regularly in general because that's one of the services we provide. And we are happy to talk with, yep. you know, talk over individual cases as needed. That's great to know that we're, I mean, we're so lucky to live in a state with, with access to um, experts who, you know, like are willing to share that information with other doctors so that we all can be as well informed as, as we can be and keep our kids safe. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, uh, one last question, if you guys have time for a quick question, several people asked uh, what, what, if you have any recommendations for um, safety during sports. So maybe a face shield or a face mask aren't, aren't possible when you're playing baseball or softball or football. Um, well, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe not, right? I mean, um, there are a lot of dancers out there, right, who mm -hmm. are actually learning to dance with a face mask on. And it turns out they say it takes them about a week to adjust, and then it becomes like a leotard, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, but there are some sports, like football, you might be able to build a face shield into the helmet, right? But there are some sports where it's just not gonna happen. Like for instance, um, and it's not fair, I'm not trying to pick on any individual sport. It's not fair, but I haven't yet come up with a way in my head to make a face covering work during wrestling. Mm, yep. And, and swimming. Actually, Dr. Definitely Grace is not. <laughs> so there are going to be some sports, but, right? Where know, there are, uh, um, a, you know, there are things that are that are afoot for some uh, sports that. That um, again, it, it's going to be, I think, more about adjusting the sport to address these things. Um, playing baseball, you know, today is opening day, all right, for the for the major league sports, and for the most part, playing in the outfield, as all of us who have done that, it's a pretty lonely place out there. <laughs> You're a long way from anybody, and and so part of the reason that sport is moving ahead is that it is a relatively low risk environment. Mm -hmm. Football is a big, big problem, um, just starting with the huddle. I mean, and, and so there are things that are gonna be harder to adapt to what we're trying to do to, to reduce risk. Um, swimming, we may be, they're, they're starting to have, you know, um, basically time trial based competitions. Um, you know, it, t it takes up a lot of pool time, but one person in a, in a lane with, a, with lane lines is a fair bit away from the other person. And they have all that water and all that air. And so there are ways, you know, for different sports, but it's all about, I think, um, being creative and being adaptive. Yeah, I think I, speaking of adaptive, like I just saw the other day that there are face shields that you can actually clip onto a baseball cap. So it doesn't interfere with anything, but it still provides that protection if you're wearing a baseball hat. And I was like, well, that's that's the kind of innovation I think we're gonna see until this whole thing is over, is finding ways, like you said, to adapt. Mm -hmm. So I wanna do a real quick recap and then I will um, we will sign off. So we want people to be talking to their primary providers if they have questions. Yep. Um, parents have the control to decide what kind of um, situations they want their children to be in, but also not to live in fear that there are lots of ways to be safe and to still have some interaction with others. Um, you know, avoid the three C's and do the three W's. 
is there anything I'm forgetting that you wanna leave our audience with just as kind of a recap of our discussion? Either one of you. <laughs> I think that's the, the biggest part, but I, I think, you know, and we, we touched on it just briefly too, but just get creative, get flexible, take lots of big deep breaths on those tough moments right. um, and help each other through it. And, you know, we have to go back to the idea um, that we have multiple layers. Mm, yeah. so it's always, in, it's important to do multiple things because we can't do all of them all of the time, but if we have our backup systems and so we're, you know, um, and even right now where we're having, you know, across the country, a, a fairly significant surge, obviously, when you get up in the morning, your chances of coming home with coronavirus are still very low on a day-to-day -day basis. And mm -hmm. so we are taking a low probability thing and trying to make it even lower. And so, you know, it's, uh, um, it's about, risk reduction and making things you do as safe as possible not to make them because otherwise you know to be completely safe is to put yourself on an island and that's not possible what about sharks <laughs> or lightning <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for joining us today for this conversation and sharing your expertise. I think this w will provide a lot of value and a lot of peace of mind for the parents out there who are watching. Thanks a lot. And thank, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for everyone who tuned in today. If you tuned in after we started, please make sure to go back wa and watch from the beginning to get all of the great information that Drs. Uh, Wellington and Dr. Creason provided us. Um, and stay tuned to our social media and make sure you follow the UI Healthcare page as well because we provide some different information on um, that Facebook page. And uh, stay tuned to our website, uihc.org or uichildrens.org for all of the, the COVID-19 infor COVID information um, as we have it. Lastly, please remember, wash your hands, wear a face covering when you go out in public and watch your distance from others. Thanks for watching.